Welcome to Jump Off Point. I'm Sly. And I'm Ensign, soon to be Captain Spook. And we have just completed season three of Star Trek Discovery. Uh, Spook. What? Just in a couple of sentences, how would you sum up Star Trek Discovery? Absolute fucking shit. You didn't use your couple of sentences. Mm. So, instead of a review, because the review will come out as we talk, um, I thought we'd look at top 10 stupid things from season three. And it's hard to limit it to 10. 10. Yeah, it's hard (laughs) to limit it to 10. So, number 10, uh, start with something simple, the uniforms. Yep. They go into the future. Yep. Starfleet, refit the whole Discovery, give them new comm badges and all that. But, hey... You guys just stay in your old uniforms. But they fixed that in the last episode. They think, and that's what was meant to be, oh, welcome and, into the fold. And they actually gave them worse looking uniforms. Well, they look like the uniform Star Trek, the motion picture. <laughs> but why did it take them nine episodes to give them uniforms? Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it doesn't make sense. I know I know. Um, from a narrative point of view, they're going, oh, well, we're welcoming them into, you know, we're finally embracing them wholly. But surely you did that when you refit the fucking ship and you gave them com badges and gave them clearance to everything. So surely at that point you said, yeah, we're welcoming you into the fold and it became your go-to ship for all crises. It's you know, not like um, Star Trek's known for its uh, uniform changes. So it's, uh, it's something you could have slotted in quite easily. And, you know, even um, in the previous season, the Enterprise uniforms were far superior looking yeah. and they were sort of modern retro nods to, to the past. Um, I thought they looked really, really good. If I was working on Discovery in a corridor somewhere, I would have been more than happy to, uh, to to wear those uniforms. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've got a lot of the answers to what goes on in this show. I can't give you anything logical as, a, as, a, okay, as an so answer. Go to number nine, and this is a two-parter. Yep. Uh, Giorgio from the Mirror Universe. <sighs> Wasn't she wonderful? So I'm trying to work this out. So Giorgio originally was Michael Burnham's captain and mentor. Yep. Uh, benevolent, stereotypical Starfleet captain, enlightened, patient, compassionate. And killed and, off. Uh, and killed off. And uh, Michael Burnham meets Georgia from the Mirror Universe, where she, she's a violent psychopath. She's condescending. She's arrogant. And Burnham bonds to her the same way she bonded to her former captain. Because the similarities. Because the similarities. It's like, so, hey. it's, like, it's, like, yeah, it's, like the, it's like a mirror. I'm, like, I'm looking into a mirror. Um, what the she... fuck? What, and the thing is that Georgia never warmed to anyone. She was constantly. No, she's just. She became a more for a fine prick. Yeah. Inside of this universe, and all she did was pop up with cameos. And and then oh, well, until they spent two episodes in the mirror universe. And then what did it fucking do to the overall season? How much did those two episodes improve? All they did was shuffle a fucking character that no one gave a fuck about um, off the show. Who and didn't deserve a bloody in two, two episodes d- d- yeah, with d- Eric, the guardian of forever. Oh fucking jeez! I mean, that was like a tear-inducing moment, wasn't it? I don't, I don't think because they did this with um, season one with uh, Captain Lorca coming from the universe too, because they're so fucking intimately because <laughs> there's more interesting things yeah. going on over there, obviously. But I don't think they actually understand a twist means something when all of the clues are there, and we know the clues are there, and then. When it's we get the twist, we go shit. We had all the evidence, we just didn't um, connect it for ourselves. But now that we see it, fuck, well done. And a really good example is Sixth Sense. You see everything, mm. and when they show it back after you learn the secret, it's like fuck, that was so clever. Yep. In Star I, Trek Discovery, it's just I, like we're going to totally go about face, and what a twist! You didn't see this. Ca- well, no, because it's not fucking logical. <laughs> I don't think you can ever use the word clever and discovery in the same sentence. And they have two fucking episodes there in the politics of the mirror universe, which, as you said, has no bearing on the fucking the arc of the season, just so they can move a character off. Couldn't they just kill her in a transporter accident? Yep. That would have been easier. You know, and number eight, I actually have her at number eight, but I mean, after the final episode, I should actually have her at number one. But Michael Burnham. Can anyone solve anything in this show other than Michael Burnham? She is a god amongst gods. She is. She makes Ray look like a peasant. She's a walking wiki page. She, and the thing that kills me is every time, like she's, you know, crew thinks, oh fuck, this hopeless situation, and they hear Michael Burnham's voice, and they will beam, and they go, oh, <laughs> thank God she's there. It's like God has reached down and touched us. She had, she worked out the burn light. I don't know. And, in four minutes and nine hundred years, Starfleet hadn't worked out what the fuck had gone on. 
I know, it's like everything. Everything that comes up that no one else could fucking sort out, even for centuries, oh, no, I've got the answer. Or I think I know the answer. Or I'll tell you the answer very soon. What a character. The other thing too is you have these other characters on the bridge who are meant to be um, assigned to certain posts. I don't know their names. Other than... Three seasons in, I still don't know half these people. Other than um, who we call Borgface, Detmer, I think her name is, who obviously drives the ship because there was a few... Um, She's an excellent pilot. Yeah. And other than her, no one... You have no idea what anyone else is doing because whatever they say doesn't actually correlate to where they're standing. It's not like, you know, in the original series, Spock would say the sciencey things, Uhura would say the communication things, you know. Sulu tactical. Yep. And go back, go to the forward to the next generation. Similarly, you had tactical and operations and all that sort of stuff. And it's, they're just all shouting out things. And it's also interchangeable. You go, I don't know who the fuck's doing what. <laughs> I don't think anyone does. Number seven. Apparently, there's only one admiral left in Starfleet. It's, it's a lonely place, um, the Federation now. And I like that character. See, uh, you're not a Federation, a planet. Yeah. And, but it's like... Don't you have other admirals in Starfleet? I mean, Next Gen was constantly trotting out new admirals to show you that, hey, there's a hierarchy here and it's not just one person. And there's a fleet that always just parks inside of that bubble. <laughs> yeah. We're well, going they, anywhere they, today? What are we doing? What are we doing, crew? Well, they had no warp travel, so... Let's just stay inside the bubble. Um, number six, and we only found this one watching the finale, turbo lifts. Oh, fuck me. Seriously, how fucking big is the interior of that ship? It was like... They're either traversing the interior of the TARDIS or it was a ball cube or something. So you fucking... You, you, your turbo lifts surely are just like a, a lift shaft. And a shaft, they, like they, an they elevator. Up, down, left Sideways, and right yeah. to get you through. And there's a tube that runs throughout the fucking structure yeah. of the ship. And that would be the most expedient use of space Yeah. To, to rapidly move around the size of a starship. This thing had fucking cavernous Death Star interior that you could see for kilometres. And there's a view fucking screen in the roof because you obviously want to be able to see where you are inside of your cavernous thing. And what was it? Little fucking rectangles hanging around that went whoosh. It was obviously meant to represent that, that light thing that was an effect in turbo lifts yeah. in, in the original series and stuff. Like in the game, oh, geez, how fucking clever are we? My fucking God. It, yeah, I, I, and I can't understand why every fucking person in this ship does no job anywhere else other than a fucking corridor. Oh, hey, we're gonna, there's we're a gonna giant have... fucking cavernous thing out there to be serviced. And what do you do? You, you, you go out there and put on your Johnny Thruster jetpack and it, go over and, and work on that wall over there? You had Jeffrey's Jews. No other fucking starship has had the interior of this fucking thing. Oh, it I was... don't think anyone who's actually working on the show has seen a second of Star Trek. It, it, it's no watching this. It was like someone had watched Attack of the Clones and had that chase scene with Obi Wan and Anakin <laughs> on Coruscant. It was like, oh, what we want is to be busy like that. It's like, really? That's how how fucking as you said, how big is this ship? How big is the interior? Yeah, what about the fucking disregard for safety? So you can now just traverse anywhere in the ship with the fucking doors of the turbo lift open. Yeah. And like the computer that sits there and says, well, my job is to make sure that you humans don't fucking die, allows them to be kicked out of there and they can float to their death. And I oh, think there'd be so many fail safes that if you fell out of one of those lifts, that the computer would merely go, ah, oh, you know, organic matter in the turbo shaft. And beam them somewhere. Beam, yeah. But no, that, no, no. You can't apply fucking any sense to this show. Number five, Corridor Trek. <laughs> How many scenes in corridors? And why are there so many people walking, are working in corridors? Seriously, so what, what sets have we got in this show? You got the Hang bridge? on, wait, wait, pause. I just want everyone who's listening to know we're recording this from the corridor <laughs> of my house. I'm, I'm just going to go for a walk along the corridor oh. and look busy. You've got the bridge. You've got engineering. Um, you've had medical. Is there anything else that they've visited? There's a ready room or something? They visit the corridors. And, but everything, fucking people just work in the corridors. And no matter where you are in whatever episode you're watching of this show, yeah, they have their fucking conversations in the corridors. Like, I'm going to walk along and we're going to have some really sort of, you know, hush-hush conversations. And hopefully all these fucking people that are just milling around us everywhere, walking around, touching screens in the background... Um, don't fucking hear or you know could they go and work in a room somewhere surely you work in astro navigation or you you go and work in um in, in the engine bay or something but no you're, you're fucking there's hundreds of this of crew in this ship that just meander around corridors well 
the funny thing is, in this season, they got the transporters to their combat just so they could just go wherever they want, and they're still just walking in corridors. <laughs> Except for that fish head. He, he, for oh, comic, he was for comic beaming relief, wherever he the beaming. hell he wanted, when he wanted, I mean, because that, that was funny. Funny, he beamed in on something. Yeah, no, it was hilarious. And, he, and he's got snot. That's always funny, too. Yeah. Number four, books ship. Oh, is the, this thing's the, amazing. Can it, it's a transformer, isn't it? it it's can a just, fucking. It's made of Lego. It just changes shape to suit whatever needs it has. That's not like it has engines or anything that need to be, you know, kept in one piece, do they? See, I mean, look. Obviously, they tried to play some sort of balancing thing here. That okay, we're a, we're a thousand years in the future. Technology surely has advanced, but no one can go anywhere because of, of warp drive. Jeez, it didn't seem to fucking stop book ship going from everywhere and, and be the saviour of that ship how many times? Let's just park it in the bay and it'll just transform into a into a beach chair. And whenever we need it, fuck me, that thing's out the door and it can just shay in shape and dodge every little um, plot device that's out there and, and be the problem solver. How do they fit it in there? I mean, where, where's all the shuttlecraft gone? Oh, but they're probably fucking parked in the cavernous area where the, where the turbo lift goes. I don't fucking know. I, I, it's amazing that you know you're creating technology like that. You know, it's just to get back to, the, to this fucking ship. <laughs> that fucking ep- and this shit me rotten that episode where um, that admiral um, was sitting there and chose to die with the fucking photon torpedo that was lodged there, and yeah. then uh, Lorca last season, Lorca yeah. had the fucking sh- not Lorca was it Lorca? who Pike. was it Pike Pike had the um, he, he watched the explosion through a fucking glass fucking window. Lord. And then when they did that exterior shot of the ship and, and a section, the saucer section was exploded and gone away. I don't remember seeing the big fucking cavernous area inside of there and the, and the floaty little fucking squares where the turbo lift could have been just going around into fucking space. What a fucking show. Well, this sort of segues into the violence. <laughs> I'm getting violent. I know. And um, how many heads exploded this season? About 28 were they after? Oh, I, I was going through about six heads how, per episode. How many disintegrations happened? I mean, that's what Gene Roddenberry wanted when he created this. He did. He, that he, he that was his biggest wish. Wanton thing. violence. <clears throat> I remember reading a biography of Gene's and he said his biggest disappointment was that he didn't have the budget or the technical know-how to make people explode on the show. <laughs> it's, but, you know, hopefully it's one making... day, people 30 years from now could be reading this book and, and make my, my realisations come true. The violence, it's, it, and the thing is, it's not even used sparingly. It just becomes... One of these things where just so much shit is always happening because they it's almost like they're worried that if they don't show a character being evil or people's heads blowing up, that the audience will forget there is, this is a dangerous situation. You go back to something next gen, remember that episode where uh, Picard got captured by the Cardassians and he was being tormented? And you think of the pain and anguish in that episode just between two characters talking in a room with lights. Yeah, I think it's called acting though. Yeah. Compared to this show, which causes pain and anguish simply by existing. Um, number two, Tilly as first officer. Well, that was convincing, wasn't it? But seriously, though, who else would you... I mean, not even her, but there's nobody of fucking any command demonstrable ability in this show. They're all just fucking... Oh, no, no one's been built up. That goes back to what I said before. No one in any of those stations has been established to an extent where they could take command. I mean, the only one probably is... Who's actually got rank is Stamets, and they're not going to use him because he's the engineer. He can't be on the bridge full time. Um, so it goes to Tilly as Ensign. She's an Ensign. That's, that'd be like making Wesley Crusher ca- uh, first officer in Next Generation. Oh, that should have happened. Well, I don't know why it didn't. And the thing is, you know, you got the crew having this warm, fuzzy moment going, oh, say yes, say yes, accept it. If I was part of that crew, I'd be going, how the fuck have you leapfrogged <laughs> me? I've been in this fucking organization for seven years. I'm still a lieutenant and you're captain on your fucking first command. Oh, it's all about inclusiveness. But the thing is, and we can, we can tie it back to one of the other things, because now we're seeing the final episode, because I wrote some of this list before the final episode, and then she surrenders it to anoint Burnham. <laughs> I'm giving you an order to be in command. Oh, fucking hell. Because I'm obviously suck at it. And then the one admiral says, Ah, oh, I have a daughter. She likes mathematics, but she doesn't like to use numbers. How fucking <laughs> else do you do mathematics? <laughs> That's the power of math, people. <laughs> and but it all flows throws back to you know being a metaphor for like oh well people can do things a different way as long as it works out. And we go back to the fucking Burnham. She had an arc. They actually had an arc for three yeah. episodes where she constantly disobeyed Saru and he demoted her. And she goes, "You're doing the right thing." Well, apparently not. 
Saru should have just said, you know what, Michael? You get things done. I am fucking resigning. You're captain. That's, it should have been like William Shatner in Flying High 2. Where he goes, that's it. I'm out of here. Pack it up. And they, they, he just, you know, packed the suitcase and left. Because, oh, actually, you shouldn't have walked off because they have transporters now that's beam immediately. But they, they need to walk 10 meters in a certain direction. It's dramatic. What a fucking show. And the thing with Tilly, too, is... Or the, that decision. Surely command is predicated on... Okay, rank, but it was predicated on rank because you have experience, you've made errors, you've learned, you've grown, you've gained the respect of the people around you. So one of the other things you would think in that situation, which is show all the JJ Trek movies doesn't fucking understand because they made Kirk Captain out of Starfleet Academy, is command only works when the people under you respect you. And there's been plenty of good movies of television. I mean, you go to something like the Kane Mutiny where the crew starts to question whether the person in charge is right to be in charge. Mm -hmm. And that only works... So that dichotomy only works if you actually believe that, hey, the crew will respect this person to the extent that they will trust them to command them and lead them to their death if, you know, if that's what's going to be. Tilly's fucking shown the composure of a kumquat and shown very little commandability. But hey... You should no, be first none off. Of, uh, none of them are demonstrated. Really. You know, there's obviously an underlying theme in this show about um, inclusiveness. Everyone's equal. Everyone's wonderful. Nobody looks down upon anybody or anything like that. There's also nobody with any sort of motivation. There's nobody that actually screams competency um, around. You know, if you become an officer on on a, on a starship, you're obviously ready and being prepped for command. That would be the whole point of the officer program, surely. You obviously need to be in charge of people and make decisions and all those sorts of things. But ultimately, you should be gunning for the captain's chair. I mean, you just look at this. This is three seasons of the show. There's nobody that you would put their hand up and say is worthy. You look back at, say, Next Gen or something like that, or even the original series, there was a number of characters in there that could have stepped up. I mean, obviously no one could replace Kirk. He's irreplaceable. But ultimately... And the card was obviously a big show. But but you could see Riker could step into that. Well, Riker was there as a a trapdoor in case the Picard character failed because they went from the action man in Kirk to someone who's more about diplomacy. And in case that the audience goes, no, we want action, there was Riker there. But Christ, fucking Data demonstrated more leadership. But ability. you have it. And Data was great in those episodes where he was forced to take command. And then you even have, like, episodes with Troy and that were taken command. And they weren't primarily in the chain of command, but they showed, you know, um, but, but the insight the, and the skill. training would yeah. be that, that you, you've got leadership skills. You... you in a, in a battle if half the bridge crew died then you've got someone that could always step into those roles I wouldn't put faith into anyone in, in, in the crew of Discovery to do anything other than trip over their own shoelaces I mean the, the one thing I will point out is like I, I, it's a really shit show it's terrible if you think it's good Star Trek then I don't know but um <laughs> uh, Wilson Cruz as Dr. Hugh Culber I actually think a good Star Trek character like he, he feels like a real Star Trek character uh, and the one who grew on me quite a bit this season, but they gave her quite a bit to do was, sorry, I'm probably going to maul the name, is Oyen Oladejo as Lieutenant Jean Oasisik. Oh, okay. They called her O1. Uh, and I thought she was really good in turn. But it, I mean, the thing too with her, if you look at it, is they gave her more to do, which is like, well, that's what you should be doing with the peripheral crew. They should be getting more to do. You go back to the original series where it really was just about William Shatner as Kirk and Leonard Nimoy as Spock and then a little bit underneath him was um, DeForest Kelly as Bones. And then all those guys like George Toke and Nichelle Nichols and Walter Keenegg, they were really just, um, initially they were just decoration. But even this decoration, they got a lot more to do than what these characters did wow. or in, in Discovery. And it's, it's a real shame because they probably could be some interesting characters. Yeah, it could be. Um, a couple of ones that didn't quite make the list. How did you like some of the subplots that were introduced and never picked up? Like um, Detner's Borgface. Oh, yeah. She seemed to be possibly infected with the... The space virus or whatever yeah. it was from the previous thing. And that went nowhere. Yeah, no, that was really good. You kept waiting for something to happen. Like even um, the, the Huey, Dewey and Louie probe droids or whatever they are. I was going to bring them up. Did they end up being that entity? Or was it the no. ship's computer that... Evolved or something? Who fucking knows? No, no, I think that was just that whole... um, 
Ever since you go back to Spider-Man 2, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man 2, not the one you like with Andrew Garfield. No, I don't like it. <laughs> um, you have that that train rescue he does. Oh, it's brilliant. And it is a brilliant scene. And it's like when the civilians recognize he's just a kid who's trying to sa- he's sacrificing himself to rescue us. And I, I think a lot of movies, and I heard the new Wonder Woman movie does this too, they try to emulate that, hey, this is a touching moment where someone or something stands up and decides to go above and beyond and gets recognition for it. And that's what like the, the Wally droids did in this finale or you know, in the, the second last episode where they said, yeah, we've got to help you retake the ship. And it's like... They all just got shot up. They all got shot up and, and all that sort of stuff. But you had the touching moment where they um, rebooted one at the end and O1 just said, oh, you've saved her. And I mean, it's a toaster, but... <laughs> um, so... It felt like it was trying to be the heartwarming moment of, ha, huh, look, look at this. Everyone's banding together for discovery. Big fuck. I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's another thing, just quickly. Saru fucking exits the ship after three seasons off screen. You had that super Borg head in season one or something yeah. that did nothing. It just was just a beach ball that stand, stood in the background and blinked. And then it was given a whole fucking farewell episode. And the crew in the, I think the start of the next episode were all mourning this character that no one even knew or give a or gave two shits about. And yet you've had an established character in Saru who you know, generally was pretty likable as a as a standalone character. Oh, fucking yeah. exits off screen. It's probably the doesn't twice. get the teary farewell. That would have gotten the way of uh, the, the the march of honor. Right, yeah. but, you know, it's ridiculous. The show is just too much about that one character who's just not that good. No, no I mean she's a right. Um, and the number one is the central premise of the show, The Burn. <laughs> so, welcome to Alex Kurtzman, man. Let's go over some of the Alex Kurtzman premises. Uh, premises. Last season. Uh, the supercomputer. What if some mystery red lights appear all over oh, the galaxy? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. JJ Trek. What if the Romulan sun just blows up instantaneously? Because that's how science sun, sun, works. Suns just blow up. I mean, they don't take It's power millions. of science, bitches. It doesn't take millions of years for suns to blow up. Picard, what if all androids just went nuts? <laughs> and now, what if all dilithium was just rendered inert? <laughs> because someone got angry once. Yes, and they're a polypoid or something, and they, I don't know, intertwined with the dilithium, and they projected some suck- fucking sort of negative reaction across the galaxy it's, it's just, instantaneously. It makes no fucking sense. I think even the characters in the show question the fucking logic of it all. But it's like, you saw at the end when he got angry, the beam that emanated from him was quite slow. So if that was going to render all the lithium in there, you, you could, I could outrun it. Uh, oh, no, I think it's the Starkiller base principle. Well, the Starkiller base even took seven seconds, but that went through sub-hyperspace because that's, again, you make up shit Magic. to Magic try ball. and carry your premises. And oh, the, what are you doing with that triple? <laughs> and the fucking... You can look at this thing if... Um, Star Trek in general, warp's always been their travel. But in something like Star Trek Next Generation, they're already experimenting with wormhole technology. They had that soliton wave in one episode. They were talking about stuff like transwarp and all that sort of stuff. Um, in 900 years, no one's come up with an alternate form of technology. They haven't... Uh, but in JJ Trek, which is where this thing's set, you've already got that trans- trans- yeah. So that, that, that immediately rendered star travel unnecessary but it just it's it's the thing that it's really annoying is like 900 years they've just been oh, i mean the burn happened uh, 120 years yeah or whatever it was but in all that time all right actually let's go back in 900 years they haven't come up with an alternate form of warp travel or uh, alternate form of travel despite the fact that like you know in the next gen era there was they'll, they'll, trilithium and stuff yeah they'll, that, they'll, they'll screwing around stuff you know, and I was screwing around with wormholes and they had Borg technology that they were trying to reverse engineer out and all that sort of stuff. And the Borg used the space, subspace condu- conduits or whatever the fuck it was uh, established in um, Voyager. Okay, so then you have the burn happens, whatever, 100 years ago. And in that 100 years, you'd think all these Starfleet scientists, no, sorry, not just Starfleet, the Klingon Empire and the Romulans and all these brilliant scientists, not one of them has come up with an alternate form of travel until obviously you know discovery shows up Dis- discovery shows up with this spore drive and it's like well let's upgrade discovery 
Whereas you think, well, hang on, wouldn't you actually just fucking rip the drive out and reverse engineer it? If they could make it 900 years ago, why couldn't you make it now? You could change the interface for standards to use and all that sort of shit. So what the sort of sense does it make that everything just stops? And that's again, that's, that's Kurtzman land. Everything just stops. And we have to accept that everything remains static from the introduction of that premise. Shit. It's seriously, I, I don't know how anyone defends this as Star Trek because it's definitely not. I don't know how anyone looks at it and goes, hey, um, this is good storytelling because it's fucking most definitely not. I find, the, I actually think there's, there's potentially some good characters there who they just don't give time to. Um, and Michael Burnham is the, the, the solution to everything. Every time she pops up and it's always like, oh, you know, they hear a voice. Oh, she's, she's fine. I mean, she got fucking stabbed in the thigh, <laughs> limped for about 12 seconds, had a massive well, martial yeah. arts combat. And well, then- there was also, there was all that prolonged combat inside of the, uh, oh, the, the super duper yeah. turbo lift space. And then she fought the green skin bird, didn't even show a sign of, uh, of limping until the fight was over. Oh, that's right. I'm injured. I don't forget the the genius of the force field around most of the medical bed, but not Not around the the door. Not the door door. behind. (laughs) Jesus Christ, this show. And you think that like, I don't know, if you're a military force... I mean, but that whole episode, without going too far into the episode, it's like, um, I don't even know what her name was. Uh, Saria, Ria, Isaira. Diarrhea. Diarrhea, whatever her name was. She goes to negotiate with the Starfleet Admiral. He goes, well, you've got to turn yourself in as a show of good faith. She goes, no... And he goes, oh, well, okay. And then she's like, I'm going back to my ship to blow you up. <laughs> and she goes don't, back. Don't try and detain me. <laughs> yes. And then in the next scene, he's on the bridge of whatever fucking little space doctor at. It's like, yeah, maybe I should have seen that coming when she said she was going back to the ship. To discovery, no Damn, she's good. Yes. Oh, and, and I mean, and just sort of to look at, like, again, some of the ones that wouldn't have made the list is the science behind the actual ship is just ridiculous. You have fucking a terrorist brand come onto the ship. There's no safety protocols that shut them out. Yeah, no, no security passwords or anything like you'd have even like today. Um, you the, can just waltz in there and take it over. And then, and I actually found this really funny too, is like she takes the ship back into the Starfleet space docky thing. You'd think the space docky thing would have an overrule on every single ship in there to stop something like that happening. No. You'd, you'd have like, um, okay, no, in case someone tries to sneak in with a Trojan horse, we can shut that down before it ever... No, no. And then they jump out. They have that great plan. Let's blow up one of the warp nacelles. That doesn't cause any death or anything going at warp speed where the nacelle is dislocated from the rest of the fucking shit. And then it's just... Repaired in the next scene. In the next scene. Just magic. Magic repairs. This show's amazing. This show is seriously amazing. It's so seriously shit. It's. I don't know why you make me watch it every week. It's seriously. I. I. I don't know. I always sort of walk in with like a bit of a net neutral temperament, like thinking, I don't think it's going to be good or anything. But I just think, I'm not going to let it upset me. And then just I don't know. Within about seven minutes, go seriously. Who the fuck's writing this? Who the fuck is in charge? Did you watch Star Trek at any point? No. What did you watch? I don't think so. I don't think they watch much, to be honest. It is like they're or. Their whole knowledge of Star Trek is from things like Andromeda and Attack of the Clones and Flash Gordon. <laughs> Flash Gordon had a killer soundtrack. Oh, well, this doesn't. Oh, does this have anything? It has a soundtrack of violence. Any final thoughts on Star Trek shit discovery? No, I can't wait for season five. I can't believe this got renewed again. I think that's just done out of spite. Um, and I've heard that Picard's getting a season two as well, which is just staggering. Um, but the thing is you watch this show because it's train wreck material uh, or car wreck or whatever the, the, the phrase is but um, you can't look away because it's burn wreck material it's just like when you think it's absolutely plumb the bottom of, of the shit barrel it digs a new hole and finds a new place to go to and it doesn't seemingly ever look like it's going to stop doing that can you, can you name one good episode that you've watched in three seasons I can name half in the second season where with Pike they went down onto that planet with the church and it was a little bit Star Trek. And, and actually, I'll give them a bit of credit for the the flashback episode with Pike and the Telosians. I thought a lot of that was done pretty well. But that also had that really stupid scene from memory where Pike came into his ready room and the fucking whole crew was sitting there at the conference table and he's looking at them like, 
what the fuck are you in here without me? <laughs> if you're going to have a conference, I should be in here as the captain. Um, but, you know, well, like they do, they did good moments in two episodes, uh, but, you know, they weren't great episodes or anything. I think it looks spectacular. I could even credit. It looks beautiful. It's gorgeous to look at. I, except for the camera angles, I don't know what the fuck is with starting things on the vertical and rotating them oh. back to a horizontal. Starting on an angle, like it, it's almost like they're going for a nautical theme of like, oh, we're going to get the ship swaying side to side. So it, it's in fucking space, you idiot. Um, <laughs> it doesn't sway side to side. And there's always these weird angles and, and there's no logic. I mean, the thing I actually found oh, hideously funny is, here, Michael Burnham, you are captain. It was just three seasons ago, you mutinied against your captain, start of the war. You're insubordinate every other minute. Yeah. And you, your actions led to the death of all these thousands and thousands of people. Um, you are captain some material because you do things differently. And Saru endorsed it too. What, like three episodes after he demoted her again for the 50th time? Oh, and, that, and that was like, you know, that whole fucking thing about when they were going to go down on that away mission. And... Um, Burnham, I think she was talking to Tilly and goes, oh, I'm afraid Saru might get compromised down there. <laughs> He's never shown any evidence of anything but the most professional behavior and she's afraid. And then they go down there and the Discovery's under attack and he's like, well, as captain, I need to be back on the ship. And she's like, well, no, you've been compromised. On what fucking <laughs> basis? He's doing exactly what he's required to do. Oh, oh It's seriously, fuck you, Kurtzman. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And that's it from us. Um, live long and prosper. Yeah, let's get some real Star Trek back on the TV at some point, please. Why bring Lower Decks into it? Oh, fuck. It just never ends. Later. All right, catch.